Greeting and salutations. I am Lloyd, a producer at LCD Productions, and I have come to share these new series of visual audiobooks with you, the listener, the supporter, the viewer. Together we will go on a journey like never before, fly to new heights with Project Aerospace, explore new land and cityscapes with flotations, even change the dimension of time through the power of time-lapse photography from live to tape. We'll even travel beyond the mind's eye into worlds captured and generated through animation from Thumbs United Daily Animation Series. As we together go on these journeys filled with photography and theater of the mind, I hope you remember the core belief that we hold, that anyone can become the master of art, meaning that it is not some born skill what makes someone good at being creative. It is a desire to practice and spend time being creative that creates the master. I hope that these films, photography, and stories inspire you to set some time aside and practice some creativity. I believe if we all spend more time creating and being constructive, the world would be a better place, a more friendlier and fulfilling place. Thank you for coming. Let's begin this journey. This is live to tape. We are recording uh, the book, The Girl Aviators and the Phantom Airship. Chapter 6, A Roadside Mystery. Now what could he be up to, Roy wondered as they sped on. Give it up, laughed Peggy, unless he was going to rabbit, unless he was going rabbit shooting, rabbit shooting with a pistol, and in June, oh Peggy, I thought you were more of a sport than that. Well, can you suggest any solution? Frankly, no, but I've been forgetting something which the sight of Fanning Harding reminds me of, and Roy at once plunged into the account of his interview with the banker and his son. To his great relief, Peggy agreed with him that on no account must the airplane be turned over to Harding, but her mind was sadly troubled nevertheless by what her brother told her concerning Simon Harding's attitude. It looks as if he was bent on hounding us, she sighed. It surely does, agreed Roy, but look, sis, there's Dr. May's house off, off there. You'll have to you have to make a landing in that field, back of the barn. Peggy nodded and deftly touched the lever or two, and the airplane began to descend. Want me to take the helm? inquired Roy. If Peggy had dared to turn her head, she would have flashed an in indignant glance at her brother, as if she was to content herself with a very haunting no, indeed. Roy laughed. You surely are the original aviator, the original girl aviator, he exclaimed. Huh? cried Peggy. By no means the original one, my dear, but there are a lot of them in Europe, and there soon will be in this country, too. I hope so, responded Roy, riding with a pretty girl in an airplane just suits me. But Peggy did not reply, and for a good reason. There were now just above the pasture lot when she meant to descend, and below them as they dropped, an amusing scene was transpiring. The doctor's horse, old Dobin, Dobin was dashing madly around in circles, faster than he had gone in twenty years of solid respectability. The two cows and old mother pig with her family joined him in a strange whirling as they as the strange whirling thing from the sky dropped lower above them. As for the chickens, they flew widely in every direction, clucking as if they had gone mad. In the midst of the turmoil, a rear door opened and a kindly-faced old man with white whiskers and a pair of big spectacles perched on his nose emerged to see what he could be causing all the disturbance. He fairly dropped to the big book he was holding in astonishment as he beheld the glistening object like a huge yellow spangful bird dropped his very black as a like a huge yellow and spangled bird dropping in his very backyard so to speak but the next instant he recovered himself bless my soul exclaimed dr mays for it was the retired physician himself i thought for a moment that the fabled days of the gigantic rock with the sinbad the sailor had his adventures had returned it must be those prescott children ah he exclaimed as the airplane aligned and came to a standstill it is, dear me, what a century we are living in. Boys and girls flying about like they are my chickens. He clucked reassuringly to the terrified birds as they hastened toward the now stationary machine. 
Roy and his sister came forward to greet the venerable old doctor as he approached. Roy hastily explained their errand, being interrupted constantly by the physician's exclamation of astonishment. Oh, back with you. Of course, I will, with my children. Will one of you help me catch old Dogen and harness him? My man, Jake, is in town today. Oh, doctor, cried Peggy reentrantly. Can we persuade you to go back with us in the golden butterfly? To fly? Good heavens. The aged physician threw up his hands at the idea. It is perfectly safe, sir, put in Roy, safer than old Dobie in his present frame of mind. And I should imagine. They all had to laugh as they looked at the hitherto staid and somber Edequin carrying about the pasture with his tail held high and from time to time emitting shrill whinnies of terror at the sight of the strange thing which had landed in his domain. I don't know. I really don't, hesitated Dr. Mays. The very idea of an old man like me riding in an aeroplane. It's, it's just splendid, laughed Peggy merrily. And doctor, I've, been, I've often heard you say to father that it was your physician's duty to keep pace with the modern invention. Quite right, quite right. I often told your poor father so, cried Dr. Mays. Well, my dear, it may be revolutionary and unbecoming to a man of my years, but I actually believe I will be brave and a new element in this flying machine of yours, more especially as we can reach my young patients more quickly than in that way. Well, Dr. Mays, who was a widower and childless, went to hunt up the old chap as headgear and his novel journey, Roy obtained permission to use the doctor's telephone. He called up Jess's home and related briefly to Mrs. Brankoff what had occurred, and asked that an automobile be sent to the scene of the accident. Mrs. Brankoff, who was at least had been seriously alarmed and reassured by Roy's manner, reassured by Roy's quiet manner of breaking the news to her, and promised to come over herself at once. By this time, Dr. Mays was already, as the young man people noted, without amusement that under his assume, assumed air of confidence, the benevolent old gentleman was not a little worried at the idea of braving what was to him a new element. The golden butterfly was equipped with a small extension seat at the stern of her chassis, and into this Roy dropped after it had been pulled out. Dr. Mays had seated in this sentry as being the heaviest of the party, while Peggy assumed her place at the steering and driving apparatus. Already behind, she called out, laughing as they settled down. All right, here, my dear, responded the doctor with an inward conviction that was all wrong. Go ahead, sis, cried Roy. Hold tight, doctor, to those straps on the side. With a roar and whirring thunder of its exhaust port, the motors started up. Dr. Mays paled, but Roy afterward expressed it. He was dead. He was dead game. Forward shot the aeroplane across the hitherto peaceful pasture lot, which was now turned into a crazy circus of terrified animals. When, when are we going up? The doctor asked the question rather jerkily as the aeroplane sped over the uneven ground, jolting and jouncing tremendously despite its chilled steel spiral springs. In a moment, explained Roy, the extra weight makes her slower in rising than usual. Look out, child, yelled the doctor suddenly. You'll crash into the fence. He half rose, but Roy pulled him back. It's all right, doctor, he said reassuringly, but to the vision... But to the physician, it seemed far otherwise. The fence had been alluded to a tall, five-bearing, white-washed affair loomed right in front of them. It seemed as if the airplane scuttling over the ground like a scared jackrabbit might, must crash into it. But no such thing happened. As the plane reared from the obstruction, something seemed to impale it upward. Peggy pulled the lever and twisted a valve, and the motor, beating like a fevered pulse, answered with an angry roar. The golden butterfly rose gracefully, just grazing the top, the fence top, like a jumping horse. But unlike the latter, it did not come down upon the other side. Instead, it soared up toward a steady gradient. The doctor, his first alarm over, gazed about him with wonder and perhaps a bit of awe. Many times he had, many times he had, Many times he and his dreadful friend, Mr. Prescott, talked over the aerial possibilities, and he had always listened with interest to what the inventor had to say, but that he should actually be riding in such a marvelous craft seemed like a dream to his venerable man of science. After his first feeling of alarm had worn off, 
the physician found that riding in an airplane after the preliminary run with its bumps and jostlings is over is very like drifting gently over the fiercest the fiercest of clouds in a glossomer car if such a thing can be imagined in other words the golden butterfly seemed not to be moving fast but to be floating in the crystal clear atmosphere but a glance over the edge of the high seated chassis soon showed the physician that she was tearing along at great rate at heights about five hundred feet fields woods streams small firehouses swam by underneath their heel well doctor how do you like it roy ventured after a few moments i like it repeated the physician my lad it's it's bully and thus did his dignity fall like a mantle from dr mays after a few moments in peggy prescott the girl aviators golden butterfly a few moments later they came in sight of the field in which they had left poor jess lying by the side of the wrecked automobile hardly had they seen the ally the aligned before jimsy and rather worried look on his face was at the side of the airplane say roy he exclaimed you didn't happen to put that jewel case in your pocket for safekeeping after the accident did you why no jess had it slipped why no jess had it slipped it under the seat while she was driving cried roy why because it's gone exclaimed jimsy somewhat blankly gone impossible presented protested roy but it is i searched the field early and the vicinity of the car and i can't find a single trace of it it couldn't have been stolen it was peggy who spoke roy thought for a, roy thought a moment all at once the recollection of fanny harding's queer actions when they had seen him on the road below flashing into his mind the road as he had observed led past the scene of the accident would it be possible for fanny to enter the field while they lay unconscious there after an instant figuring roy had dismissed the idea had such been the case the son of the banker would have been much further off when they had deserved him from the aeroplane than he had been the speed was making the speed he was making would have carried him far from the wrecked auto and had been near at the had been near it at the time of the accident occurred what then could have become of the jewel case it must be here exclaimed roy positively nobody could have taken it while dr mays bent over jess and examined her injured ankle and others searched the field in every reasonable direction but not a trace of the jewel case could they find all at once the noise of the horse hoofs coming at a rapid trot was heard from the road roy thinking it might be someone with whom might make inquiries hastened to the hedge and peered over he saw coming toward him a disreputable looking old ramshackled rig driven by a red-haired man of big fame who was slouchy slouchily dressed his chin had once been shaven but now the hair stood on it like bristles of an old toothbrush by the side of this individual seated none other than the emaciated fanning harding in a motorcycle right motorcycle clothes why that's gid gibbons the most disrespectable character about here exclaimed roy in amazement what can fan harding be doing with him he now noted that his further astonishment was perplexity that there was a third person in the rig gid gibson's daughter a pretty girl in a coarse way had and given to a loud dressing she had plenty of black hair and a pair of dark eyes that might have been beautiful if they had not been a certain hard defiant look in them as they drew near van harding turned and seemed to whisper something to the girl whose name was hester at which they both laughed heartily that was chapter six next chapter is chapter seven peggy is puzzled Thank you for experiencing this journey we have created here at LCD Productions. For more information on how to support these films and projects, visit fortations.com forward slash support. Fine art photography prints from journeys around the world can be purchased from fortationsstore.com. And digital downloads of our photography and visual audiobooks is available for personal use. Commercial use is available at a different rate. Thank you for your time. I hope to see you here again.